Good evening, everybody. All right. Thank you so much. You can be seated. We have been looking forward to returning here. We always enjoy being in this church and uh, the family has become our family. And it's always a, an honor to be here. And I love being in churches and auditoriums and convention centers and places where people are receptive to the Word of God. Are there any receptive people in here tonight? Well, I know they are because I've been here before. Praise God. Amen. Good to see you, Pastor Jose. All right. You have your Bibles with you tonight? Well, Pastor Jerry said to me when I came in, uh, we we're waiting for the prophetic word for 2024. I told her, I said, normally the first place I preach it is in my own church. And, uh, and I've done that. So I can say it here now, praise God. And let me give you a little background with it. Uh, I, I usually say this. I learned this from Kenneth Hagin many years ago. Brother Hagin said that every time he told the story of Jesus appearing to him and placing the, his fingers in the palm of his hands and calling him into the healing ministry, when he told that story, it seemed to bring a, a stronger anointing. People began, began to expect things to take place. And so, even though you've heard this, but I say it because of what I learned from Brother Hagin. In uh, 1991, while I was preaching with Brother Copeland in the Believers' Convention in Fort Worth, on Thursday night, as he introduced me, and he was about to walk off the platform, he stopped and said, Jerry, before you start, the word of the Lord's come to me. And he came back up to the podium and began to prophesy over me. And Brother Copeland has prophesied over me many, many times. We, we have, uh, this is my 54th year in the ministry, and I've been preaching with him for 53 of those 54 years. And he's prophesied over me many times. And every time he does, it comes to pass. So I, I, I welcome a prophetic word from Brother Copeland. And uh, so he said, uh, God's moving you into a new dimension of ministry beginning tonight. He said, and it has to do with the office of the seer. And God is going to begin to show you things that are coming, that are on the horizon. And once he reveals it to you, then you are to take it to the body of Christ, wherever he might send you. And then shortly after that, I was preaching all over Southern California and I had one night off and Brother Hagen was going to be in Riverside, California that night. So I had made my plans to be in his service. I was staying in Los Angeles and uh, I've, I've spent a lot of my years in ministry in Southern California. So I'm very familiar with it. I know, I know how horrendous the uh, traffic is out there and I know how long it takes to get from Los Angeles to Riverside. And I don't like being late. So I, I planned to leave plenty early so I'd be there on time. I didn't let Brother Hagen know I was coming. I didn't tell any of his staff I was coming. I just wanted to show up and be in his service. And uh, as it turned out, uh, the traffic was even more horrendous than normal and normal is bad. And uh, there were a couple of times when I, I thought, uh, I don't want to be late and I know I'm going to be late now. And I thought about turning around and going back, but I knew I was supposed to be in that meeting. So I persevered and I kept going. Well, I wound up getting there an hour after the service had begun. So when I walked in the back door, I noticed Brother Hagin was still sitting on the platform, had his head down looking in his Bible, and the Raymond singers were still singing. So I hadn't missed the sermon yet. So I didn't want to disturb anybody. I just went across the back road to find a seat. And apparently, as I'm looking for a seat, Brother Hagin raised his head up and saw me. He stood up and said, you can stop now. He's here. Brother Jerry, God told me you'd be here. Come on up. I have a word for you. And so I went up to the front. Brother Hagin began prophesying over me. And Brother Hagin's prophesied over me many times in the past. And every time he's prophesied over me, what he said came to pass. So I always look forward to if he had a word for me, praise God. And so he said, uh, Brother Jerry, uh, God's been dealing with you about a new office of ministry and you've been a little hesitant to move into it. 
And he said, the Lord told me to tell you that it's time for you to move in, move up and move out. And he said, you know what I'm talking about? And I said, yes, sir, I do. So after the service, uh, we had some time to spend together before me, me going back to Los Angeles. And he said, you know, this has to do with the prophetic ministry. I said, yes, sir. And I told him what Brother Copeland had prophesied over me just a short time before. He said, yes, yes, I, that, that's what I see. So what are you going to do about it? I said, move in, move up and move out. Hallelujah. <laughs> and then shortly after that, I am back. I went home and traveled to some other cities. And then I went back to Southern California. I was in Anaheim. I get a call from Oral Roberts that morning. Brother Roberts said, Jerry, where are you preaching tonight? He said, I heard you were back in California. I said, yes, sir. I'm, I'll be in Anaheim tonight. He said, is Carolyn with you? I said, yes, sir. She is. He said, well, tell Carolyn to save two seats next to her for me and Evelyn. We'll be there to hear you preach tonight. I said, wonderful. Uh, can you come a little early where I can say hello to you before I go out to preach? He said, we'll, we'll do our best. So they did arrive there a little early and we just greeted one another. And then the ushers took them out and set them next to my wife. After the service, Brother Roberts came up to me and he said, I'm not going to tell you what I saw tonight and what I heard. I'm going to write it to you in a letter. So when you get home, expect a handwritten letter from me. I said, yes, sir. I'll look forward to it. So when I finally got home on my desk was a four page handwritten letter from Oral Roberts. And uh, uh, the, be the, the, the gist of it was, he said, when I heard you preaching tonight, so he went home right after that service and wrote that letter. He said, when I heard you preaching tonight, I heard you preaching prophetically. He said, God's doing something new in your life and your ministry. He said, and I encourage you every time you go to the pulpit, preach prophetically. And uh, then there were other things in the letter. And uh, shortly after that, I'm in Tulsa preaching with old Roberts. And he said, now I'm going to, I'm going to preach first. And then you're going to close it out. And so I said, yes, sir, that's, that's exactly what I'll do if that's what you desire. So Brother Roberts preached first and then uh, he came over and said, no, Jerry Savelle is going to close it out tonight. Well, I didn't know when I went up there that T.L. and Daisy Osborne were sitting in the audience. And when I walked up to the podium, I saw the Osbournes. And they were my fourth mentors, along with Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Hagan, Oral Roberts, T.L. and Daisy Osborne. Everything I know about world evangelism, I learned from the Osbournes. And so they're, on, they're just a couple of rows back. And uh, after the service, Brother Osborne came up to me and he said, uh, Brother Jerry, uh, we heard that you were going to preach and be preaching with Brother Roberts tonight. And uh, <clears throat> we've been praying for you. And the Lord has given us a word for you. I said, okay, what is it, sir? He said, uh, God's moving you into a new dimension of ministry. And he said, and you've already heard about it. I said, yes, sir, I have. He said, are you going to obey God? I said, yes, sir. He said, good. So uh, we look forward to seeing you again next time. And I expect you to be flowing in that office when I see you then. And so what else am I to do? All four of my mentors saw the same thing within a couple of months of each other. So uh, I had no other choice but to move in, move up and move out. Amen. And so since that time, I have set apart the first couple of weeks of October to just seek the Lord as to what he has on his agenda for the coming new year. Amen. Now I've had people say, well, you mean God would tell you that? Well, of course, that's part of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, when the, when the spirit of truth comes, he will not only lead and guide you into truth, but he'll show you things to come. He'll show you things to come. I don't know about you, but I don't like being the last one finding out what God's up to. I, I, I remember when I first came uh, to the Lord in 1969 and I, I began reading and seeing that Peter, James and John, I, I called them insiders. They seem to be around Jesus uh, and hearing things first before the other disciples did. And so I said, Lord, I want to be an insider. I don't want to be the last one to find out what you're up to. I want to be inside and hear it 
and be involved in it. And so, uh, as I said, the first two weeks of October, I set time aside just to seek the Lord. And every year he has given me a prophetic word that I am to take to the body of Christ everywhere I go. And I don't change that. I preach on it everywhere I go. And of course, the more I preach it, uh, the more insight and revelation I receive. So by the time the year is up, I preach so many sermons on that one prophetic word that dear Lord, if you didn't get it, it's not my fault. <laughs> Amen. And so, uh, uh, and, and then every year after I receive it, then I say this to the Lord. I say, if you don't mind, I, I certainly would uh, uh, appreciate if you would confirm this in my life and ministry now. So when I take it to the rest of the world, it will give validity to the message. And he's honored that every year. So whatever he's given me, he causes it to come to pass immediately, a portion of it anyway, immediately. So when I take it to the rest of the world, I have evidence that if it can, if God can do it for me, he can do it for you. Amen. Amen. So I say that to you tonight. If he can do it for me, he can do it for you. Amen. So last year, uh, 2022, the word the Lord gave me, as Eric mentioned earlier, he said, tell the people everywhere you go in 2022, or 2023 rather, this was October, 2022. He said, tell the people everywhere you go in 2023 that it's time for the maximum, the highest level attainable. He said, my people have been settling for far less than my best and it's time to change. He said, tell them they don't have much time left. I believe we're the generation that's going to usher in Jesus. Anybody feel that way? I mean, and, 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 and there's certain things that must come to pass before he makes his appearance. And so he said, it's time for, the, for my people to go to the maximum and the highest level attainable. Now, let me just illustrate that with a, 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 something that happened to us uh, a few years ago. Uh, there's an, a young man that uh, has been very, very familiar with my ministry. He, he told me that I'd had an impact in his life in his early stages of his walk with the Lord. And he eventually became a motivational speaker. And he, he spoke in a lot of Fortune 500 companies. And he, he called our office and said, tell Brother Jerry, if he ever would like for me to come and speak to his staff, I'd be honored to. And so we set it up for him to come one day. And uh, so we gathered up all of our staff and, and we invited some other uh, people to come and be in it. When we turned the, the meeting over to him, his opening remarks was this. He said, how many of you in here believe dogs love bones? Everybody lifted their hand. Let me ask you that question. Anybody in here believe dogs love bones? I lifted my hand right along with everybody else. This is not a trick question. Okay. How many of you believe a dog loves bones? Okay. So I lifted my hand because I have a dog and I had just given him a bone that morning before I went to the office because I brought it home from the restaurant. You know, they have doggy bags and uh, it still has some meat on it, you know? And so I brought it home from my dog and I gave it to him before I went to the office that morning. He took it and ran off with it. So I know my dog loved bones. So I had my hand up. The next thing out of his mouth was, dogs don't love bones, they love steak. They settle for bones. I put my hand down real quick. <laughs> now, if you don't believe that, if you have a dog, put a steak out there and put a bone next to it and see which one he takes off. Dogs love steak, but they settle for bones. I said, that'll preach. And that's what the body of Christ has been doing for years and years and years. We've been settling for bones when God's offering steak. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, how much longer are you going to settle for bones? <laughs> and, and a great example of it is, a great example of it is, just like Eric said earlier, the Bible talks about 30 fold, 60 fold and 100 fold. Now you won't find anywhere in the Bible where it talks about 200 fold or 300 fold or 400 fold. 100 fold represents maximum. 
It's symbolic of maximum. Okay. So if there's uh, a choice, 30 fold, 60 fold, a hundred fold, why are we settling for 30 fold? Okay. I'll try this sort of auditorium. Got no response on this side. Why do we settle for 30 fold when hundred fold is available? Amen. 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 Now I'm the kind of person and I've been this way ever since I came to the Lord because I didn't have uh, a, a, a religious background per se. I mean, I, I grew up in a little country Baptist church and, uh, and you know, and as soon as I got old enough to tell my mom I wasn't going anymore, I, I quit going and I don't remember much that the pastor preached about. I don't ever remember him talking about, you know, redeemed from the curse, the blessing of Abraham or ours. And, you know, I, I did, I did hear him say, there's none righteous, no, not one. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. We're just all sinners saved by grace. That's about all I remember the pastor talking about. And so I didn't know anything when I came to the Lord in 1969. I was, I was shocked when I found out that you could actually live by the words in this book. I thought it was just a history book. Things that happened to people a long time ago that didn't have anything to do with us. And the night Kenneth Copeland came in 1969 and preached the first message of faith that I ever heard, I couldn't run anymore. I said, I went home that night. I didn't go forward in the service. I went home that night and I, and I said, Lord, is all that he said true? Is that really and he, he, I remember he, he closed the service like this. Now I'd never seen a preacher like this before. He was there for a week, three services a day. My wife never missed a service, begged me to go every night when I came home. I didn't want to go. I told her, no, I don't want to hear another preacher. And uh, she said the last night, if you will go tonight and you don't like this preacher, I will never ask you to go again. I said, you promise? I said, now that's the deal I've been waiting on. If I don't like him, I'll never have to go again. I promise I'll never ask you to come again. I said, okay, I'm going to go clean up and get dressed and go hear this preacher you want me to hear. And then I told her, I said, now, the moment we, we're going to sit on the back row and the moment I don't like him, I'm going to get up and leave. You get home best way you can. She said, well, I've been doing that every night anyway. So what's new, you know? So we went and, and I wasn't that impressed at first, you know, and, and then the more he preached and there's certain things that happened I won't get into, but the more he preached, eventually I'm right on the edge of my chair, hanging on to every word he said. And then I remember his closing statements. He's, a, he's at the pulpit like this, grabbed his Bible, notebook. If you believe it, it'll work. If you don't, it won't. Good night. I'm out of here. I thought, dear God, where's this guy been all my life? I turned to Carol and I said, John Wayne has finally come to the pulpit. Because all those others were like Wally Cox, you know, just, just. They apologized for everything they preached. And then bawled and squalled and begged for offerings for an hour. And that's the reason I didn't want to go hear another preacher. But man, John Wayne. In fact, he mounted the pulpit like John Wayne. You know, and I thought, where in the world has this man been all my life? So I went home that night and I heard things I'd never heard before. And I just said, God, is all that true? He said, yes, it's true. Well, I couldn't run anymore. I surrendered my life to the Lord that night, three o'clock in the morning, February the 11th, 1969. And uh, I owned an automotive business at the time and it took me a few months to shut the business down. And, and then I began preparing for full-time ministry. And then I started studying the Bible for the first time in my life. And I'm, I'm discovering things in the Bible that, that obviously I did not know were there. And I said, now, Lord, if there's something in this book that you didn't really mean, tell me now so I don't waste my time believing for it. That was 54 years ago. And now one time as God said to me, by the way, son, I didn't really mean what I said there. I was just trying to come up with something to fill in the blanks. 
He meant every word. Amen. And I believe every word. Amen. Amen. I said, I believe every word. Amen. Anybody believe every word? Amen. And I apply every word to my life and God has been honoring it for 54 years. Hallelujah. Amen. And he's no respecter of persons. Can you say amen? amen? So he'd do it for you just as well as he'd do it for me. Amen. amen. So he said to me, actually it began in the latter part of August and I was, I was in a meeting and the Lord said, uh, I want you to tell the people everywhere you go in 2024. Now you might want to write this down. It's the first part of it. And that's what I'm going to deal with first of all. He said, tell the people in 2024, everywhere you go, that it is vital, it is necessary, mandatory, that they stay in faith, remain focused on my promises, and do not allow anything in the world to distract them. Now I'm going to say that again. And he, he said it with, with a, a strong emphasis. You know, I, I, later I read a, a scripture in, in, in Timothy where Paul was writing to Timothy and he says these words, the spirit speaketh expressly. And that's the way I heard this. That was, was, was uh, with, with, with uh, a seriousness, a, a eagerness to get it out, you know. And the Lord said for me to tell you as well as everybody I preached to in 2024, that it is vital, it is necessary, and it's mandatory that you stay in faith that you remain focused on the promises of God and do not allow anything that is happening in the world around you to distract you. Okay, so that's what I wrote down, uh, first of all, and then coming into October in my time with the Lord for what else he might say, because I knew that was not all of it. And then he said this, if you, you tell them if they follow those instructions, then 2024 will be a year of progression, a year of advancement, and a year in which their highest expectation will be fulfilled. Amen. A year of progression, a year of advancement, and a year in which their highest expectations will be fulfilled. I think we want to lift our hands and thank God in advance for that. Praise God. Amen. Amen. How many of you are interested in progressing? Interested in advancing. Amen. Amen. Well, it requires staying in faith, first of all. It requires remaining focused on what God's promised us. And then it requires never allowing yourself to be distracted. And that is a major problem in the body of Christ today. There are people in the body of Christ that believe more in what CNN says than what thus saith the Lord says. Amen. 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 Distractions are one of Satan's mightiest weapons. If he can distract you, he can deceive you. If he can deceive you, he can beat you. Distractions are how that he robs us of God's best. Amen. I mean, you know, during COVID in uh, 2020, uh, my last meeting in 2020 was in March. Uh, I was in Denver, uh, Colorado, and I had preached a, a Saturday morning, Saturday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and I got in my airplane and flew home after that Sunday night service. Next morning, everything shut down. Uh, COVID hit and everything shut down. I couldn't, I couldn't leave Fort Worth until August of that year. Okay. And, and even though I pastor a church, I'm a, I'm a found, I don't pastor it. I'm a, I'm the founder of the church. We have some wonderful pastors, but you know, church is shut down. Uh, uh, nobody's traveling. Nobody's leaving town. And brother Copeland and I did some virtual victory campaigns out at his ministry but we only had about 10 people in the audience and they were just being shown live by live stream and so forth. But we never left town until August of that same year. Now, I'm a traveling ministry. 
You know, I've been traveling since 1969. And even though I have a strong partner base and I really don't have to travel anymore if I don't want to, but it's what I do. And I love what I do. Amen. I heard in 1969, go ye, and I haven't heard stop ye yet. <laughs> so that's, that's what I do. And I, and I, I love traveling. I love being in uh, various nations and being among the body of Christ on a large scale. I know some of you may not ever get out of North Miami, but that, I don't have that limitation. I'm, I'm, out of, I'm away from my home 20 days out of every month and been that way for 54 years. And I, I've, I've seen the world on a large scale. We, we've been in all over Africa this year, been all over Europe this year. I mean, we had some meetings in Ethiopia. I'm telling you, the anointing of God was so strong, the people broke loose. I mean, they broke loose and ran forward just trying to touch you. And, and they broke through the ushers. And, and, and I mean, they had my arms, they had my legs. They were, I thought they was going to rip my clothes off of me. <laughs> and finally, Tony Armstrong, who travels with me, and Tony was a former uh, NFL football player, great big guy. And uh, he travels with me all over the world. And I finally, I said, Tony, you got to get me out of here. They're hurting me. <laughs> so he just picks me up and takes me out, you know. <laughs> And then Joe was with me and Eric was with me. I mean, wasn't it? I mean, I'd, I'd never been in anything quite like it before. And uh, later when I got to my room, the Lord said, now you know what I went through when they were thronging me. I said, well, I've been in a throng tonight. So we've been all over the world just since I received this word in October of uh, 2023, the first part of this month. And, uh, and the more I preach it, the bigger it gets and the more testimonies we get. I mean, I've only been preaching this message about advancing and, and progressing for about three weeks now. And we're already getting testimonies of people that are experienced the fulfillment of it. And once again, if it would happen in Africa and it would happen in Pennsylvania and everywhere else we've been, well, why wouldn't it happen right here? In fact, I'm expecting you to have testimonies before I leave. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. Now, I want you to go to the book of Luke, first of all, tonight. Luke chapter 22. And I'm sure you're familiar with this. You remember the first part of that word was, Tell the people, stay in faith, remain focused on the promises of God and don't allow anything in the world to distract you. If they follow these instructions, then their 2024 will be a year of progression, a year of advancement and a year in which their highest expectations will be fulfilled. Amen. Now, in Luke chapter 22, in verse 31, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to sift you as wheat. He has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Now, the word sift means to extract something, to remove something. And Jesus said to Simon, Satan desires to have you so that he can extract something from you. And that's true with us as well. The reason Satan attacks us is so that he can extract something from us that is dangerous to him. Amen. I remember uh, I was preaching Brother Robertson another time and uh, we were in the maybe center and had, I don't know, seven or 8,000 people in there. And, uh, uh, when I was, when I got through preaching, this lady came up to me as I was leaving the auditorium, going back to the hotel. She said, brother Jerry, I, I, I have a question. I said, yes, ma'am. I'll do my best to help you. She said, no, brother Copeland preached a couple of days ago in this conference. And he talked about how the devil had come against he and Gloria 
and, and just tried to destroy their ministry and, and so forth and, and said, and he gave the testimony of how he, how he overcame and, and all that. And I said, yes, I, I, I was there when it all happened. I know the story well. And then uh, Brother Roberts uh, got up and talked about how the Satan had attacked his health and, and he had to, uh, you know, he had believed God for recovery in his health. And, and I said, yes, ma'am, I'm fully aware of that. Uh, I've been around Brother Roberts. I've served on his board all these years. And then when things like that happen, he calls the board and asks us to pray. I said, I, I know what you're talking about. And he said, uh, she said, and then you said tonight that, you know, you've, you've had some challenges and, and you had to stand in faith for quite some while. And then God came through for you and all that. And she, I, I said, yes, ma'am. I said, but what is your question? She said, well, I don't understand. Why is the devil bothering all you boys? He never bothers me. <laughs> now she, she didn't like what I said. She wasn't expecting this answer. I said, well, lady, apparently you don't have anything that's a threat to him. I mean, why would Satan attack somebody that's not a threat to him? Huh? Kenneth Copeland has something on the inside of him that's a threat. Or Roberts had something on the inside of him that's a threat. I have something on the inside of me that's a threat to the adversary. Do you? <laughs> Amen. So notice here, Jesus said, Simon, Satan desires you and he wants to sift you as wheat. Now, I was born on a farm in Mississippi. We didn't, we didn't, my grandfather didn't plant wheat, but, but I'm very familiar with, with uh, combines. Uh, when I first met Charles Capps, he was still a full-time farmer, just launching out into his teaching ministry. And I would go and spend time with Charles in his home. And I would get up in the mornings and, and go with him to the field on those large combines and, and watch him harvest, okay? And a, a sifter is, is a mechanism that causes that wheat to become fine grain, fine flour, okay? And it has to do it, that, that, that combine, when it's sifting the wheat, it has a, a forceful vibrating motion to shake that loose, okay? That's what Jesus is describing here. Simon, Satan desires to shake everything I put in you out of you. Why would that be important for Satan? Because if you have no word in you, then you have no faith in you because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word. He said, he desires to have you, to sift you as wheat to extract something out of you that is dangerous to his operations or dangerous to his endeavoring to attack you. Now, it not only represented Satan wanted to extract something from him that affected Simon's present, but if he could get it out of him, it would affect his future. Amen. Can you see that? It would affect his future. So what was it Simon had in him that Satan was trying to sift? Well, it's very obvious. The next verse, look at this. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. That thy faith fail not. Now, the first time I read that scripture way back there in 1969, I thought it was a misprint. In fact, I went into my wife. Now, my wife been filled with the Holy Ghost since she's eight years old. And uh, she'd, she'd been in this all her life. She grew up in Oral Roberts' tent crusades. Uh, her pastor, Jack Moore, was friends with all the great healing evangelists of the 40s and 50s and early 60s. They all came to her church. Okay? So she grew up in this. And when I first came to the Lord, of course, I knew very little. So as far as I was concerned, Carolyn and the Holy Ghost were one and the same. You know, she, she helped interpret everything for me. Okay. And so I went into where she was with that, 
with my Bible. I said, Carolyn, I found a misprint in the Bible. She said, there are no misprints in the Bible. What are you talking about? I said, Jesus prayed that Simon's faith would not fail. I said, every sermon I've ever heard from Kenneth Copeland or Kenneth Hagin or Oral Roberts or T.L. Osmond, none of them ever talked about the potential or the possibility of faith failing. And that was a shock to me. I mean, here I am doing my best to develop my faith because I was told faith moves mountains. I was told this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Every, every, every blessing, uh, every promise in the Bible is received by faith. Hebrews chapter 11, the famous chapter on what faith will produce. And now I come across this and Jesus is praying that the man's faith won't fail. I thought, do you mean to tell me I'm, I'm doing all this studying and, and, and putting the word in my heart to develop my faith and, it, and it's a possibility that it might even fail? That was a shock. So I started trying to find other translations. I thought, well, maybe it says a little different in some other translations. <clears throat> and I did find some other things. But when I finally discovered the Greek, oh, what a great insight it was. In the Greek, where Jesus says, I pray that your faith fail not, the Greek is, I pray that your faith will not be reduced to inactivity. I pray that your faith will not be reduced to inactivity. Faith doesn't fail, but it can be reduced to inactivity. Amen? Amen. And only you can cause that to happen. Now, if, if your faith has been reduced to inactivity, I like to say it this way, inactive faith is non-productive faith. And what, what would cause someone's faith to be reduced in activity? Distractions. Distractions. Uh, focusing more on what the media says, focusing on what the world says, focusing on what unbelieving believers say rather than what the Word of God says? If you keep doing that, then eventually your faith is going to become inactive. And if, and if you're not uh, overcoming, then you have no one to blame but yourself. Just like the scripture that uh, Pastor read earlier about sowing. If, if you're not sowing, then whose fault is it you're not reaping? Amen. Whose fault is it that you're not experiencing a harvest? Yours. Now, I know we don't like it being our fault. We want it to be somebody else's fault. We got that off Adam. Remember God came through there and said, uh, son, what happened here? And he said, that woman thou gavest me. I was doing fine until you made her. Did you notice that didn't impress God at all? <laughs> we always wanted it to be somebody else's fault. But if, if, you're not, if you're not receiving harvest, then I can only come to this conclusion. You're not sowing seed. Oh, I am sowing seed. Okay, if you are sowing seed and you're still not getting harvest, then you gave up on your seed. Giving up on your seed would mean inactive faith. As Brother Hagin used to say, don't shout me down because I'm preaching real good, huh? <laughs> If you're not receiving harvest, it's not God's fault. It's not the Word's fault. It's not Jesus' fault. Not the Holy Ghost's fault. It's not the angel's fault. Did I leave anybody out? You. Amen? You. So notice here, Jesus is praying that Simon's faith will not become inactive. Because inactive faith is not producing anything. And one of the major reasons why Christians allow their faith to become inactive is they become distracted. They start focusing on other things. Now, one of the book of Proverbs says, let your eyes look right on. Uh, uh, it, it talks about how important it is to protect your heart. Protect your heart with all diligence. 
by watching what you see, what you look at or being careful about what you look at and what you listen to because the eyes and the ears are the gateways to the heart. Whatever you see and whatever you hear gets in your heart. And if it gets in your heart, it starts coming out of your mouth. When it comes out of your mouth, you're releasing an energy and, and you can have what you say, good or bad. Amen. So a distraction is, is detrimental to your faith. It may not look like it at the moment, you know, well, I was watching the evening news and they said, you know, uh, it's getting worse and COVID's coming back and we all need to have another vaccination. Next thing you know, you're not believing God for your health. Is this too deep? <laughs> and what happened? Inactive faith. And inactive faith is not producing any results. So Jesus prayed, Simon, I'm praying that your faith will not be reduced to inactivity. Now, I think it's interesting that just a few hours later, a few hours later, when, when Jesus was taken and Peter is outside the court and the little maiden comes up to him. He says, aren't you one of his followers? I know not the man. And Jesus already warned him before the cock crows three times, you'll deny me. And Peter, you know, no, master, I wouldn't dare do that. Maybe James or John, but not me. No. And that little maiden came up there and said, you're one of his followers. No, no, I'm, I don't know the man. She said, I'm, all, I'm sure I saw you with him. I don't know the man. I know I saw you with him. I don't know the man. So what happened? Just a few hours after Jesus said, I'm praying that your faith will not be reduced to inactivity, it happened. Why? Because Satan comes immediately to steal the word. Amen. I mean, it's amazing how you can hear a, a, an inspiring message of faith. And by the time you get to your car, Satan's already stolen it. Amen. I mean, you know, you can get so excited in here, hearing a, an inspiring message of faith. You get so excited, you feel like biting the back out of the seat in front of you. Let me at the devil. And you walk outside and you got a flat tar. Oh, why does this always happen to me? You lose your joy. Sometimes get upset with God, blame him. Reduced faith. Are, are reducing uh, the, inact the activity of your faith is detrimental because it, it does not position you to experience what God is trying to get to you. You got to keep your faith active. Amen. Amen. I, I said this jokingly one time, but at the same time serious. I said, uh, I, I had gone through a situation where I could not afford to relax my faith for one minute. I was building a medical facility in the nation of Kenya and every devil in Kenya came against me. I mean, people are robbing from me. People are, people are uh, trying to kill our, 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 our staff over there, trying to poison them and, and uh, crooked government officials are, are stealing from us. And, 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 and I, I, I finally had to hire an attorney in Nairobi to fight this. And, and it would have been easier. In, in fact, I, I'd, I'd read a scripture just a few days before where Jesus said, if you're not received, then shake the dust off your feet. And that's what I wanted to do. And the Lord said, no, that doesn't apply to you. I said, why not? He said, you owe it to your partners who helped you build this to fight for it. So you just stay here and fight for it. So I did. And I'd be in a meeting somewhere and I'd get a call. I'd have to be in court in Nairobi in the next 24 hours, take 21 hours to get there, get off the plane and walk straight into court and then deal with that and get back on the plane, fly back to the U.S. And, and I, I mean, I could not relax my faith for one moment. And then I was having to go to Australia. 
and I didn't want to go. I, I was drained spiritually, mentally, and physically. I'd fought and fought and fought and fought. And now I've got meetings in Australia. I said, Lord, I don't want to go. He said, no, you gave your word you'd be there. I said, can't I just send them some videos? No. So I got on the plane, American Airlines, and I flew to Honolulu. I got off the plane in Honolulu. I mean, if you can't have joy in Honolulu, something wrong with you, you know? And, and I'm looking at the ocean, I'm looking at the palm trees and, and I'm dragging, I, I'm dragging my briefcase behind me. I'm so worn out and I don't want to be here. And then I've still got eight hours to fly to Australia or more. So I get to my hotel. I had a room with a view of the ocean. I was so worn out, I just shut the drapes, got in bed, slept for a few hours, got up, showered, and I thought, well, I'll go down and have some dinner because my flight wasn't leaving until the next day. So I went, I, I got in the elevator and went down to the lobby. And when the doors opened, Brother Hagen and Aretha are sitting in the lobby. They saw me same time I saw them. And I found out they were not staying in that hotel. This was their 50th wedding anniversary and they were in Honolulu and they were in the hotel next door to where I was. But they decided to come over and sit in the lobby and watch the people in my hotel. <laughs> I guess that's what you do when you've been married 50 years, you know, <laughs> sit in the lobby and watch people. You know? <laughs> So they were, they were sitting in the lobby and I knew, uh, I knew they were there, but I'd heard they were at the hotel next door. So, and I, and I, I, I had said when I went downstairs, I was going to have a meal and then I was going to go shopping and buy something for their anniversary, take it over to their hotel, leave it at the front desk and just let them know that Jerry Savelle wanted to say happy anniversary. I never expected them to be in the lobby of my hotel. So when I come out of there, Brother Hagen stands up, Brother Jerry. And so we greeted one another. And the first thing he asked me was this, how's your work going in Kenya? <laughs> now, if there's anybody you want to learn to talk right in front of, it's Kenneth Hagen, <laughs> right? I mean, this is where I learned Mark 11, 23. Yes. I was shocked at what came out of me because I was drained spiritually. He said, how's your work in Kenya? I said, Brother Hagin, I'm almost ashamed to tell you this. <laughs> Brother Hagin, I feel like I've been raped, beat up and left for dead. I thought, oh my God, I can't believe I said that. <laughs> he said, you know, back in 1948, I went through a situation and he told me what he went through and how, he, how the Lord delivered him. And then he got up to 1950 and told me another situation. Then he got up to 1952 and told me another one. And then finally, Aretha said, sit down, Jerry, it's going to take a while. <laughs> We're only up to 1952. This is 1986. And he told me story after story after story. And by the time Brother Hagen got through with me, I didn't even need a jet to get to Australia. I was hiring a Georgia pine tree, man. What happened? Faith cometh. See, my faith had become inactive. I was drained. And Brother Hagen, in about an hour, got my faith up to another level. Man, I could hardly wait to get to Australia. Had outstanding meetings, went back to Kenya, fought that battle. And we, they, over in Kenya, they have a magazine that is equivalent to the Look or Life magazine. No, Newsweek or, or what's that other? Newsweek or something that we have in the U.S. And in there, there was four pages about this trial that we went through. And it said, Jerry Savelle, Dr. Jerry Savelle is the only American missionary who's ever gone to the Supreme Court in Nairobi, Kenya and won. <laughs> Amen. But it took, it took Kenneth Hagin being in Honolulu right when I needed him. He stirred my faith so that I could get back in the, in the battle and win, praise God. So notice, 
If my faith had remained inactive, I wouldn't be able to give you that testimony. And there may be some of you in here tonight. You've been through some challenges, been through some issues, been through some uh, adversity. And, and if you'd be honest with yourself, you probably would say, yes, I have allowed my faith to be reduced in activity. I haven't been, I haven't been as diligent in my pursuit of, of believing God as I have been in the past. I tell people, if that's your case, then go and dig up in your closet or under your bed or in that dresser drawer, those old cassette tapes of Kenneth Hagin, <laughs> Kenneth Copeland, Old Roberts, Charles Capps, Norval Hayes, Jerry Savelle, <laughs> and listen to them again and allow them to do for you what they did for you the first time you heard it. Amen. How many of you remember the first time you ever heard the word of faith? Did an explosion take place on the inside of you? It did me. And that's the reason to this day in that little briefcase right there that I carry with me everywhere I go, there's a little iPod in there. It's one of the first ones that came out when they started making iPods. I carry it everywhere I go. It's in that briefcase. And in there, one day, now I'm not computer savvy. You know, I have, I, 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 I say, I, 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 I've learned how to turn one on. And then I get the grandchildren to help me from there, okay? I'm not computer savvy, but I do know how to believe God to pay people that are. Okay, so... I went over to my house. Somebody gave me as a gift, this little iPod. It's in that briefcase. And I went to my house and I gathered up out of my closet in my library, all of my old first from 69 to about 74 tapes, reel to reels, cassettes of Kenneth Hagin and all those men I mentioned. And I took over to my media department. I said, I want all this downloaded on this little iPod and I want it by Friday because I'm, I'm flying overseas and I want to be able to listen to those messages while I'm flying. They said, by Friday? I said, yes. And if you have to work overtime, I'll pay you overtime. But I want them on there by Friday. On that little iPod, I've got about 2,000 messages. And I listen to them almost every day. Why? Because faith comes by hearing Amen. and hearing by the word of God. And I don't ever want my faith to become inactive again. Amen. 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 So if you're struggling in something tonight or have been for a while, then I would highly recommend you go back and get those books, get those tapes, get those cassettes, Listen to them again and listen to them like you've never heard them before so that the same thing will happen to you that happened the first time you heard it. Amen. Because from here on out and you mark my words from here on out, you're going to need your faith more than you've ever needed it before because this world is not getting any better. It's not even the same world we lived in three years ago not even the same world we lived in last year. Do you remember what the Bible says? When Jesus returns, will he find faith in the earth? Will he find faith in the earth? Well, I'm going to stand up and say, he'll find it in my home, praise God. He'll find it in the Savelle household. Faith got us where we are today and faith's going to take us where we need to go tomorrow. Amen. So don't allow your faith to become inactive. Okay, now go with me to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1. <clears throat> 1 Timothy chapter 1. <clears throat> and let's look at verse 19. <clears throat> Excuse me. Holding faith are holding on to faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. Holding faith. Now the message 
translation says, keep a strong grip on your faith. Keep a strong grip on your faith. If you, if you release it or you allow it to become inactive, then you'll wind up shipwreck. The message translation says, if you, if you loosen your firm grip on your faith, you will, you will end up making a thorough mess out of your life. Amen. So notice Paul is writing to his son in the Lord, Timothy. And, and of course there's two, two primary letters here, first and second Timothy with a lot of instruction. And of course, a lot of it pertains to a young minister, but obviously there are principles that pertains to everybody in the body of Christ. Okay. And one of them is holding faith. Hold on to your faith. Keep a firm grip on your faith. If you don't, then you could wind up shipwrecked. You can make a thorough mess of your life. I remember a, a, a pastor friend of mine, uh, I was preaching in Winston-Salem, North Carolina years ago. It rented a, a convention center there. And uh, this couple that was familiar with my ministry, they invited this man and woman to come to the service. And he didn't really want to. Sounded like me back there in 1969. And he, he was uh, an executive with a, with a large firm, but he, he was foolish and, and you didn't, didn't use his money wisely. And he was so deep in debt that he, he, he could hardly think straight. And he said, I don't want to go to a preaching meeting. All, that, all they do is just want my money and I ain't got any money. And so they, they, they insisted that he go. And on the way over there, he said to them, why do I want to hear a preacher? My, my, my life is like a shipwreck. That night I preached from this verse. And I said, if your life is a shipwreck and that got his attention. And he, he actually said, did, did you tell him to preach that? I said, no, we haven't seen him. We hadn't seen him since the last year he was here. And that's the text I preached from. And today he pastors a powerful church. I mean, it's an amazing church. And he tells that testimony every time I come. First time I heard Jerry Seville, my life was a mess. My life was a shipwreck. And that night he preached on how to avoid a shipwreck. <laughs> Amen. And here's how you do it. Keep a firm grip on your faith. This is not the time to let go of your faith. You're going to need your faith more now than you ever needed it before. Can you say amen? amen. Now, <clears throat> I want you to go with me to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now, Paul has given this young man a lot of instruction. Would you agree on that? From 1 Timothy 1 all the way to 1 Timothy 4, there's a lot of instruction. But in my own personal opinion, nothing was more important than verse 19. Keep a firm grip on your faith. Why is that so important? Because the just shall live by faith. One translation says, the just shall have their lives sustained by their faith. Sustained by their faith. In other words, it, it's how we stay afloat. It's how we, uh, we, 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 we have our needs met. Our lives are sustained by and through our faith. So I personally believe that verse 19 was probably the most important thing that, that Paul said to Timothy. If there was a, a list of priorities, I'd put that at number one. Keep a firm grip on your faith. If you fail to do so, then you could end up shipwrecked. And then notice in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 15. Meditate upon these things. What things? All these instructions. All these instructions that Paul had given him. Now, to know them all, you'd have to start in 1 Timothy 1 and go all the way down to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now notice, meditate upon these things Give thyself wholly to them. Now, to meditate on them, that means keep it in your thinking all the time. 
You know, uh, I, I, I tell people, so I've had people say, why does a preacher need an airplane uh, to get from A to B? <laughs> Go with me sometime for one month and you'll find out. Okay, so I call my airplane another office, another personal library. Because I'm thinking all the time. I'm thinking all the time. In fact, we don't say much while we're flying, do we? I mean, uh, we, we, we fly, we might have a meal on the plane. And we may talk about something going on in the ministry, but most of the time I'm just sitting there quiet because I'm listening all the time. I learned that from Kenneth Hagin, that you can stay in a, in a prayer mode all the time. And prayer doesn't mean just asking God, it's listening to God as well. And so I, I endeavor to just stay in a prayer mode all the time. I'm listening. I'm listening. And many times they'll see me get a notebook out and start writing something I heard. You know, I'm meditating. And then he said, not only meditate these things, but give yourself wholly to them. W-H-O-L-L-Y. In other words, give your entire being to these instructions. Devote yourself to them. Commit yourself to them. Don't just hear them. Commit yourself to do them. Amen? So what's he saying? Meditate on them. Give yourself wholly to them. And notice what will happen if you do. It says that thy profiting may appear to all. That thy profiting may appear to all. Now the Amplified Bible says it this way, that your progress will be evident to everybody. How many of you want to progress? Amen. How many of you want to advance? Amen. Then here's what Paul is telling us to do. Number one priority Stay in faith. Keep a firm grip on your faith. Number two, stay focused on the promises of God. Number three, don't allow anything around you to distract you. Meditate on these things. Give yourself wholly to them. Commit to them. And if you will do so, then your profiting will, be, will appear to all, or as the Amplified Bible says, your progress your advancement will be evident to everybody. The Passion Translation says, everyone will see that you are moving forward. Amen. Hallelujah. Anybody want to go forward? Amen. That's always God's direction for our life. I don't believe it's ever God's will for us to regress. God's interested in us progressing. Amen. Remember what he told the children of Israel when they got to the Red Sea and they thought it was all over? Moses said, what do we do now? And God almost acts surprised that he had to ask. Go forward. Go forward. Yeah, but there's a Red Sea. Go forward. Yeah, but there are obstacles. Go forward. Yeah, but the media said, go forward. Go forward. What do we not understand about go forward? Amen. Amen. There have been many, many times my going forward felt like a baby step. But the fact that I took the, the, the action to just take that baby step, walls begin to fall. Amen. Rivers begin to split. You know, lakes, uh, uh, seas begin to open. Amen. Just Just doing all that I could at that moment. And it felt like just a baby step. But the fact that I was moving forward, even a baby step is moving forward. Amen. Amen. And the moment I put some action to my faith, can I give you a great example? I'm going to anyway, shake your head. Yes. <laughs> now you, you've heard me tell this, uh, but a, a great example of it. Uh, about seven years ago, I went to have a physical because I had turned 70 years old and my daughters were saying, Dad, you're 70 now and, and you haven't had a physical in a long time. I think you need to have a physical. I said, why? I'm fine. I'm highly motivated. I, 
You know, I don't have any pain. I don't know of anything wrong with me. Yeah, that's good, but we just think you need to have a physical. So the, we went and had a physical. And they found out there was a couple of things. And one was there was a blockage in the artery that goes from your heart to your brain through your neck. And he said, it's 75 to 90% blocked. He said, and that could cause an aneurysm. He said, now it's a routine surgery. All we do is do an incision in your neck and then just remove the plaque buildup. You'll probably just be in the hospital overnight and then go home, rest for a little while, and then you'd be back to doing what you do it. So we did. And uh, they, the girl said, daddy, do it. And so we went in for the next, the next morning, they prepped me to go in and, and the doctor said again, it's just a routine surgery. You'll probably be home tonight, the latest tomorrow morning. That's the last thing I remember when they took me in. So anyway, they did the incision and sewed me back up and everything. And then uh, my wife and daughter said, can we go to lunch? We've been here all morning. Uh, will he be back in his room when we get back? Yes, go ahead. He should be in the recovery room by the time you get back. Well, when they came back from lunch, he met them at the door and said, I'm sorry, there's, there's something that's happened. He said some of the plaque broke off and went to his brain and he's had a full blown stroke. Wow. <coughs> and he said, uh, uh, we, we weren't expecting this. And uh, he, he, he's, He's got a serious stroke. Now I'm, I'm out. I don't even know what's going on. Okay. So anyway, they, they moved me into a recovery room and I, I don't know anything. My brain, I'd have no memory whatsoever. They, they put my wife and daughters in front of me and said, who is this? I didn't know who they were. Asked me their name. I didn't know who, I didn't know what their names were. And, and the only word I could say in English was yes. And, and I would watch people's mouth and when it quit moving, I assumed they were through talking. So every, every, the only response I could give them was yes. Whatever they ask, their mouth's not moving, yes. That's all I could say. Lost total use of my right arm and right leg. Total memory loss. The doctor told my wife and daughters in the natural, he will never be normal again. He'll never travel again. He'll never preach again. You're going, to to, you're going to have to take care of him for the rest of his life. My wife said, you don't know my husband and you don't know our God. My husband has not finished his course. He will be back. Now I can't, I can't fight for myself, but thank God for believing wife and believing children. They stood in the gap for me. Praise God. Okay, I don't even know what's going on. I'm totally blank. Tell you a funny part of it. My son-in-law came in one day, sat down on the bed next to me, and I'm just, I'm just looking out at the hall, just blank. And he sits next to me and he says, Dad, yesterday when I came up here, I don't know if you knew I was here, but yesterday when I came up here, you told me you wanted to give me your 1967 Corvette. He said, and he knew the only word I could say was yes. See? He said, can I come pick it up today? And he said, now I don't remember it. He said, I turned to him and said, no. <laughs> and he jumped up and said, he's getting better now. We can all go home. <laughs> I don't remember any of it. Now, my wife tells me that Kenneth Copeland came and stood over my bed for two hours preaching to me. I barely remember him being there. But the amazing thing was, she said, you just laid in bed and looked up at him and he stood over you and preached. He, put, he pumped the word in you for two hours and said, even though you may not even be aware of him being there, the whole time he was there, you prayed in tongues. You prayed in the spirit the whole time he was preaching. Now, after I recovered, I asked the Lord about that. I said, why was I only able to say yes in English, but I could pray in the spirit nonstop. I got a great revelation. You ready for it? Amen. This will help you. Amen. He said, son, your spirit's not connected to your brain. 
and all that's coming out of your spirit. Amen. That's why I was able to pray in the spirit. And that, that came as a great revelation to me, praise God. Amen. And so a couple of days later, the doctor told my family, you can take him home now. And they put me in a wheelchair and rode me out. And of course, I, if, 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 I, uh, if I, this arm, I had to take it like this and put it up by my chest and hold it with my left hand. If I let go, it was just dead weight. And they had to help me walk because I couldn't use my right leg. And, and they get me in the wheelchair and get me in the car and take me home. So I get home and my granddaughter, Rachel, she sat me down in our den and at a table. And she said, now, Papa, I'm going to be your coach. And said, and you tell people all over the world, don't quit. You're known for telling people, don't quit. You've said so many times, I've heard it nearly every sermon you preach, quitting is not an option. And she got right in my face and said, I'm not going to let you quit. You understand, Papa? Yes. That's all I could say. She put some coins in a little piece of clay, took my hand and put it on top of there and said, now get them out of there. It's probably a good thing I had no memory. Probably a good thing I couldn't say anything. Because the way she looked at me and said, now get them out of there. I'm not going to let you quit. <laughs> I want, it, it, probably if I had been able to talk, I probably would have said, when are you going home? <laughs> you know, <laughs> no, no, I'm not letting you quit, Papa. You, you get that coin out of that clay. She put my hand on there. I can't even move my fingers. And I, I tried my best. It was, it was, what's the word I'm looking for? It was frustrating trying to do something so simple, you know, and can't do it. And finally, I got this finger to wiggle a little bit. And I dug it down in that clay and I saw that coin. And she said, I turned and smiled at her. I don't remember that. But I, I, she said, keep, keep going, Papa. And I kept digging, kept digging. I got that coin out of there. And I turned and gave it to her. And she put it right back in there and said, do it again. <laughs> she would not let me quit. And then a little later, I, 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 with my left hand, I pointed to the back of the house. She said, what do you want, Papa? I pointed to the back of the house. She said, you want to go to your museum? Yes. So I put my arm up like this. She helped me walk out to the museum. She unlocked it. She turned the alarm off, turned the lights on. And my museum is full of classic automobiles and classic motorcycles. Okay. Uh, on the second floor is a, is a 50s diner. And that's where our family had, and had enjoyed birthday parties and all of that, you know. But down on the lower level, it's all classic cars and classic motorcycles. So I'm standing there looking at all this. In my heart, I know, even though I can't express it, faith without corresponding actions is void of power. So I pointed to my oldest motorcycle, which is a 1942 Harley Davidson that actually saw duty in World War II in Russia. And I, 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 she helped me walk over there. And in my heart, I was determined I'm going to start everything in there before I walk out of this building. What am I doing? Endeavoring to go forward. So I stood by that, that 42 Harley and it's hard to start even when everything on your, in you is working perfectly. It's not electric start, it's kick start, and there's a process you go through. It's like trying to start a Model T Ford. But I don't even remember how to start it. So I stood there over that motorcycle. She's holding me up. And I started praying in the Spirit. And the Holy Ghost told me what to do. And then... Uh, Rachel had to hold me up so I could get my right leg on the kickstart. And I kicked down on it three times and it started. 
Then I went over to my 46 Harley and did the same thing. Then I went to my 57 Harley and did the same thing. Went to my Indian bikes and did the same thing. Went to my Triumph bikes and did the same thing. Got every motorcycle in there started, just left them running. Then we went for the classic cars. My oldest is a 32 Ford Roadster. And I started everything in there. I have a classic Corvette collection. Started every Corvette in there. Left everything running. I like to say the smell of fumes was exhilarating. Hallelujah. <laughs> Then I had to cut it off real quick so we wouldn't die in there, you know? And, and so I got my arm up like this. Rachel's helping me to the door. We get to the, the door. She turns the lights off. She turns the alarm on. We walk outside. And I said, Rachel, give me the keys. And I did it with my right hand. She said, Papa, did you see what you just did? I said, what? She said, you're reaching for it with your right hand. I said, I did. I got my arm back, got my leg back. I took three steps, got my memory back. And without, in less than a month, Joe and I were traveling all over the world again. And I haven't let up since, praise God. Amen. Now notice what it took. Notice what it took. To me, that was a baby step. I had to, I had to get my faith active. Amen. 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 Even though I had help doing it, but on the inside, I knew there had to be corresponding actions. I can't believe for this miracle, just sitting in the house, feeling sorry for myself. I had to put some action to it. I had to get my faith active, even though my wife and my daughters, their faith got me home. But now it's time for my faith to get my recovery. And when, I, when she got me over that motorcycle and I got that thing started, I, I knew my recovery would be soon. I didn't know it was by the time I walked out that building. Amen. 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 Now, let me say this. Can you see what would have been the final outcome if my faith had remained inactive. I wouldn't be here tonight. I'd be back home in some chamber in them trying to rebuild my brain cells because that's what they wanted to do. But God. Amen. But God. Hallelujah. Amen. And now I've had, a, I've had an opportunity to pray for other stroke victims and getting testimonies of healing. Praise God. Amen. So notice here, Paul says, meditate on these things. Meditate on what? These instructions. What instructions? The instructions I'm giving you tonight. Stay in faith. Say it with me. Stay in faith. Look at your neighbor and say, stay in faith. Tell another neighbor, I'm telling you, stay in faith. Now tell somebody else, Stay focused on the promises of God. Tell somebody else, and don't allow anything to distract you. Now your homework tonight is go home and meditate on these things and give yourself wholly to them. In other words, commit to it. Make a quality decision that as of tonight, I will not allow my faith to be reduced in activity. I will keep a firm grip on my faith. I will stay focused on the promises of God and I will not allow anything that's happening in this world around me to distract me. And because of it, my profiting or my progress is going to appear to everybody. Hallelujah. You're going to, you're, everybody's going to know that something is happening to you. That something good is taking place in your life. That's what Paul said. If you will follow these instructions, meditate on them, give yourself wholly to them, then your profiting will appear to all, or as the other translation says, your progress will be seen by everyone. Amen. Amen. Now, what is the main reason why God wants us to progress, progress, advance, our highest expectation fulfilled. What is his primary purpose in that? Yes, it makes our life better, but your life then becomes 
an evangelistic tool. Why? Because everybody will see your progress. Everybody will see you advancing. Amen. That's what it's all about. He wants your life to be better. Yes, of course. But he's going to use this progress and advancement in your life to draw others to him. And folks, we got a lot of people to draw before the appearing of Jesus. Can you say amen? Amen. You receive that tonight? Praise God. Now that's just part one. That's just part one. We got, what, two more services. And we're going to keep building on it. Keep building on it. Keep building on it. Stand to your feet, if you will, please. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Tell somebody, my 2024 could very possibly be my finest year thus far. I will progress. I will advance. And my highest expectations will be fulfilled. And everybody around me is going to see it. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give the Lord a great shout of praise. (laughs) Hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. Let's just lift our hands and just worship the Lord for a moment. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your word and thank you for your promises. And thank you for where you're about to take us. We're so honored that you love us this much. That your word says that our eyes have not even seen and our ears have not even heard and our hearts have not even conceived yet all the things that you've prepared for us in the days ahead. But we are rapidly approaching them and we believe 2024 will be a year that we will progress like no other time, advance like no other time and our highest expectations will be fulfilled. And we give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 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 Now, there's, there's something that I'm impressed with the Lord to do before I turn the service back to the pastor. And I don't, I'm not endeavoring to do this to embarrass anybody. But I, I sensed in my spirit when I was praying this afternoon in the hotel room that there'd be people in here tonight that certainly fit the description of what we're preaching about uh, loosening your grip on your faith because of things that have taken place in your life, perhaps over the last year, over the last few months. And once again, if you were honest with yourself, you'd say, yeah, that, that's me. I, I haven't been as forceful with my faith as I normally have been or like I used to be. In fact, if you were honest, you might even say, I've been tolerating some things that once I wouldn't tolerate at all. Well, that's an indication you've relaxed your faith. Now, once again, not to embarrass anybody, but to help you. There's power and agreement. We've all been there at one time or another. I I told you my experience with, you know, meeting up with Brother Hagin in Hawaii. You know, I was trained spiritually. My faith was at its lowest level because I'd fought and fought and fought the good fight of faith. And I, I used to box when I was in college. And, and even when you win, you go back to the locker room, you're worn out. I came home from college one time, my nose on this side, both eyes swollen shut. My dad said, son, what are you learning in college? I said, I'm trying to learn how to duck. And when I won, you couldn't shut me up. When I lost, I don't want to talk about it. But even if I won, man, the next day, everything hurts. Your hair hurts. Everything hurts. (laughs) And that's the way I felt spiritually with everything I'd been through in Kenya. By the time I got to Honolulu, everything hurt. But thank God for Kenneth Hagin being there at the right time when I needed him and just telling me those stories of how he went through various adversity and what God did to deliver him. And that was faith building, faith inspiring. And I trust 
it's been faith inspiring to you tonight. So I just, I'm just here to help you, not to condemn you, not to embarrass you. So if you identify with what I just said, I would count it an honor to lay hands on you. So come on, make your way up to the front. Could we just worship the Lord here for a moment? Thank you, Lord. Come on, lift your hands. And just worship the Lord. Sing it out. No one like him. on you, I want you to say out loud where you can hear it, where I can hear it. I receive in Jesus name. You got that? The moment I lay hands on you as a point of contact to release my faith and release your faith. You say out loud, I receive. And then as I go down the line praying for others, you just keep worshiping Lord. We're going to keep, we're going to keep singing the song. Stay in an atmosphere of praise. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus, I lay my hands on these precious people and I'm believing that their faith will be inspired. They'll leave here tonight with a new focus new determination to never allow their faith to be inactive again. And as they stir up their faith, you will respond to it and things will happen. Manifestations will take place. And as a result of it, it'll continue to inspire their faith and they will stay in faith throughout the rest of their lives. In the name of Jesus. I receive it. In Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus. Receive it. Receive it. In the name of Jesus. Receive it. In the name of Jesus. Receive it, sir. In the name of Jesus. Receive it. In the name of of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Come on, continue to sing it out. No one like him. In the name of Jesus, receive it. Let me hear it. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Receive it in Jesus' mighty name. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Did I miss anybody? In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You guys can go back to your seat. In the name of Jesus, receive it. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus, receive it. In the name of Jesus, receive it. Oh, hallelujah. Faith arise. Faith arise. Faith arise. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 
Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus, receive it. Glory be to God. Receive it in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Receive it. Oh, glory. In Jesus' name, receive it. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus, faith arise. Faith arise. Faith arise. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus, may faith arise. May your faith arise tonight to a new height. In the name of Jesus, receive it. Hallelujah. Come on, let's all stand and give the Lord a great shout of praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Faith arise. Faith arise in the name of Jesus. We thank you for it. Hallelujah. Thank you. Say this with me, everybody. In the name of Jesus, my faith has been inspired tonight and it will remain inspired. I will stay in faith. I'll stay focused on the promises of God. I'll not be distracted. And my 2024 is going to be a wonderful year. I will progress. I will advance. And my highest expectations shall be fulfilled. And give the Lord your absolute best shout.